Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the next installment of our speaker series. My name is Kelsey Ferguson, and I'm a GIS technician for the Aurora Research Institute. Uh, GIS stands for Geographical Information Systems, which is about connecting data and information to location. Uh, so for this work, that means flying drones, analyzing landscape data, and then making maps to communicate that data with others. Um, and some of you may know this week is Geography Awareness Week, and today is actually GIS Day. So for GIS Day, we like to celebrate by showcasing the different ways that GIS and geography can be used to explore the world around us. So this chat, I think, is going to be perfect for that. Um, so I've just got a few housekeeping details to get us started, um, just so that everyone is aware of how we can participate in today's webinar. So you can submit questions to today's presenter. And I will read those questions at the end. Um, and you can do that by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen and a little button that says Q&A should appear. So if you click that, you'll be able to ask the question. Uh, the questions are only visible to the web webinar moderators. Um, and as I said, the presenter will do our best to answer all the questions um, at the end of the presentation. And if we run out of time, we can uh, work with Mike to get those questions answered afterwards. Um, we will also be recording this webinar and we'll post the video on the Aurora Research Institute website. And towards the end of this webinar, I will put a link to, the chat, to that um, website where we post them in the chat. Um, but it will be a day or two before this webinar is up on the site. Um, okay, and with that, I will get started. So today we are pleased to have Dr. Michael O'Rourke join us to talk about climate change and archaeology and mapping threats to new Vialuit ancestral sites. Uh, so Mike, you can please take it away. All right, just get my screen shared here. There we are. Okay, so thank you very much, Kelty. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Inuvik. So I pay my respects to the Inuvialuit and the Gwich'in whose ancestral lands I currently reside in. And in so doing, I pay my respects to the ancestors of this place. Koyanaini, Masi, thank you. Uh, so as Kelty mentioned, my name is Michael Rourke. Uh, I'm a research associate at the Aurora Research Institute. Uh, I also hold the climate change archaeologist position with the NWT Culture and Heritage Division. I'm also an anthropological archaeologist by training, uh, which means that while the focus of my work is largely on the material remains of the past, uh, what I'm really interested in is how people in the present value those remains and how those ways of valuing the past might lead to a culturally appropriate form of man heritage management. Uh, so again, is in recognition of GIS Day today, I thought I'd tailor the talk a little bit to address some of the ways that maps and mapping processes can be used to effectively involve the Nuvialuit community members in addressing the impacts that climate change is having on Nuvialuit ancestral sites. Before I get too far into it, I should note at this time that you're going to hear me use the term Inuit Nunengat over the course of this talk. And this is to describe what's more often referred to as Arctic Canada. Uh, this is the term that the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami organization has requested that people use when referring specifically to the homelands of the Inuit. Uh, it's important to consider this not as a mere change in terminology, uh, but rather as a change in the way that we conceptualize the area overall in more humanistic terms. Now, there's four distinct Inuit regions in Canada, including the Inuvialuit settlement region and the western extent of Inuit Nunengat. Over the course of my doctoral and postdoctoral research, I've had the privilege of being able to work with the Inuvialuit, whose ancestors have called this region home since time immemorial. Now, Inuvialuit ancestors have left traces of their lifeways on the landscape over the centuries, uh, many of which have been very well preserved in permafrost soils, uh, which helped to protect some of the more delicate organic remains from rotting away. Uh, one of the most visible examples of these remains are igluriwit, or igluriwak in the singular, uh, which is a form of sod house. So these are dwelling structures. Now you can see in this 
uh, artist rendition uh, created by staff at the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre. Uh, these are glory wheat, or rather glory wax singular, um, are entered through these entrance passages, which were partially excavated into the ground underneath the house. Uh, so they actually acted as cold traps, really ingenious ways of keeping the warm air in and the cold air out. Uh, so you can see an individual here popping up from the entrance passage uh, through what's referred to as a catac, and this would be the entrance portal into the main living area. Uh, so you can see in the living area, it primarily consisted of a communal floor, um, and often we would find one to three alcoves situated around that central floor area, uh, each of which would have been used by an individual family group. So a glory wheat in much of the mainland and New Yellowit settlement region were made from the abundant driftwood resources, which were provided in this otherwise treeless region by the discharge of the Mackenzie River out into the Beaufort Sea. Uh, so here in the upper right image, you can see uh, this is an overhead shot from the community of Tuktoyaktuk. So these are two iglurioit which have been recreated um, right near town, or just inside town, near where there were actually a series of archaeological sites in the past. Uh, so you can see here these kind of lobes around the outside of a central area. This one doesn't have sod on it. Uh, traditionally, they would have had sod built up for insulation to build up along the sides. Uh, this lets you get an idea of what the superstructure kind of looks like underneath. Uh, this one does have the sod built up around it. Uh, if you're ever in Tuktoyaktuk, strongly recommend you go and check these out. Uh, they're right down near, I think, the Northern Store. Um, really incredible examples. And in fact, the sod covered one is stunning inside. Uh, you the wood's all been varnished, really nicely maintained. Uh, I think they even rent it out for family meetings and whatnot, or family gatherings. Uh, just really nice examples of a recreation of these aglurate features. Uh, down here, we have an image of what we sometimes find out on the land, these older collapsed aglurate. Um, so we have this kind of a donut shape to them, if you'll forgive the term, this sod berm around the outside, and then the hole in the middle, which is where that house floor would have been in here. So you can imagine these timbers collapsing down, uh, leaving this kind of donut. Uh, and here, there's a little bit of a trench running out. That's actually the entrance passage heading out to what is now the beach. Uh, there are, however, other more portable elements which have survived in the present day. Uh, and this slide just shows a few examples of the incredible material record of Inuvialuit ancestral lifeways. Uh, up here in the upper left, I kind of put this in as a bit of a devotional to my partner who studies the history of Inuvialuit skin clothing. Uh, this is a needle case, uh, which was located actually in the water margin, so it had washed out of a site. Uh, beautifully decorated, this would have held a number of really fine bone needles, uh, critically important sewing equipment uh, for the making and maintaining of skin clothing. Uh, which in turn is essential for life in the region. Uh, speaking of which, in this upper right image, uh, this is located at a very old site on Banks Island. It's actually a child's kamek, uh, term for a boot. Uh, this kamek is over 2,500 years old. Uh, it stands as one of the oldest examples of footwear anywhere in Inuit Munica. Uh, a couple other examples here. These are a series of blades that were located during survey, maybe over the span of 10 minutes we located that many. Uh, this is an example of a beautifully decorated comb. Um, these are often decorated quite ornately, uh, just incredible workmanship, beautiful when these pop up out of the ground. But uh, here is a composite tool. This is actually a woodworking tool. So this is a hand adze that would have been used to process all of that abundant driftwood in the area. So you can see here a wooden handle, uh, perfectly contoured to an individual's hand. Uh, here is a nice heavy wooden socket piece that would have been lashed onto the top. You can still see the lashing hole in the wood handle uh, and a nice stone, really heavy polished stone blade, nice and smooth, perfect for woodworking. So I should note at this point that every one of the objects you can see right now were either located on a beach near an eroding ancestral site or they were recovered during the excavation of an actively eroding ancestral site. So everything you see here was in the process of being impacted by climate change. Well, the material record of the New Yellow Ancestral Lifeways is truly remarkable. Uh, so too are the impacts that climate change is having. Uh, these are just a few of the impacts which have been observed at archaeological sites throughout the New Yellow Settlement region. 
I'll touch on a couple right now, but go into more detail on other ones in a moment. Uh, so increased vegetation growth, as you can imagine, uh, these sites are relatively close to the surface underground. Uh, as vegetation becomes taller, the roots become deeper, different kinds of uh, plant species come in, taller shrubs and whatnot. Uh, those roots have a very bad impact on those material remains underneath. Uh, increased animal activity. So we see Siksik, uh, the ground squirrels. They're hilarious to watch work, uh, tragic to watch at work when they're actually burrowing through an Lurilac feature. Uh, they really like to dig into these things. Um, as a result, of course, we also have bear problems uh, because bears like to dig after the Siksik. Uh, so bears can do a whole lot of damage in a very short time period. There's actually a house that we were assessing at McKinley Bay that had been completely ripped apart by bear action looking for these Siksik dens. Uh, and then, of course, we have coastal erosion, permafrost melt, uh, tundra fires, and sea level rise, which I'll go into in a little more detail now. Uh, so coastal erosion, I think, is having by far the most impact on the UVL and ancestral sites right now. Uh, these are immediate impacts, uh, the mechanical impacts, the removal of materials from the shoreline, uh, and they're only slated to increase as time goes by with increasing warm temperatures, uh, stronger storms, more abundant storms, and longer warm periods mean more periods without ice on the shoreline, meaning these storms can have a greater impact for longer periods of time. So in this image here, uh, this is a Glurioac feature which was excavated during the Arctic Char Project. Uh, so my PhD work was a component of the Arctic Cultural Heritage at Risk or Arctic Char Project, which was directed by Professor Max Friesen at the University of Toronto. Uh, many of the images that you see today are going to be from that project ultimately. So here you can see this Glurioac. Here's the central floor area. This is partially excavated. We still had quite a bit more work to do at this point. Uh, but these really nicely outlined alcoves. So there's one here, one here, and there's another partial one here. So you can see right along here, this is actually a bluff edge. Uh, so down to the beach below is about two meter drop. So this is vegetation that's kind of hanging off of that bluff. Uh, we had a team of people actually working on the bluff edge, actively excavating and eroding alcove. Um, so really pretty serious impact on that house, uh, which was the reason that it was often decided to go in and excavate that particular feature. Uh, here in the upper right, you can see a selection of artifacts. Uh, these were actually collected during tea breaks. Uh, so we would take our tea down on the beach below, kind of walk along for 20 minutes, contemplate the meaning of life, skip some stones, uh, and invariably we would come across these objects, um, which would literally come up with the tide. Every new day we would find different objects waiting. Uh, so I put that up really just to show you kind of the volume of material that is washing out of some of these Inuvialo and ancestral sites. Uh, here again is this house from McKinley Bay, um, which I showed on the yeah, opening slide. Uh, this is a site that uh, was worked at by Matt Betts, uh, so another student of Professor Friesen's back in, I think it was 2003, 2004. And when Matt was working out here, this Igluriwak was roughly 15 meters from the shoreline. Uh, so about 10 meters later, here it is, it's already being impacted by erosion. Uh, we went to visit this site during the Arctic Char project over a number of years, and in the three-year time span, uh, the entire house was lost. Uh, so we came back in 2016, and the house had literally tipped off the side of the shoreline. Uh, so it, wave action had undercut the house, all of these really fine sands that were underneath it, and just like an iceberg calving off of a glacier, the entire house was lost that season. Uh, really quite tragic to see happen uh, as we got there in 2016. Uh, so another impact is permafrost melt. Uh, permafrost has a couple different impacts. One, we can lose materials slowly um, as they rot in the ground. So permafrost, you know, you've got frozen soil, say, and in the summertime, the top layer of that melts, but then it refreezes, it melts and refreezes, and it keeps going over and over again. Uh, so that is called the active layer. Um, as temperatures increase, uh, as we have longer summer seasons uh, with these warm temperatures, that active layer gets deeper and deeper. And so we start to see more and more impacts on any of the other ancestral materials that are still in the ground. Uh, it's a slow process, uh, but it does introduce bacteria, oxygen, water to those objects, and it ultimately results in their rot. And as slow as it is, it's happening everywhere. So this is really kind of a blanket impact that's happening in the region. And on a much more immediate fast scale, uh, we have these thaw slumps. So these occur when permafrost uh, or even massive ice, you know, permafrost with these 
big lenses of ice inside them. I mean, they get exposed either to river action carving away at the shoreline or at the riverbank uh, or wave action on the coastal shores. Uh, those permafrost soils become exposed. And of course, this is in the summertime. We don't have running water in the winter in this region. Uh, so those warm temperatures get at those soils and they begin to preferentially melt back. And you actually see the land liquefy and pour out into adjacent waterways. Um, this often results in what was referred to as a headwall this right here. Uh, and those can propagate backwards by dozens of meters over the span of a single summer. Uh, some of these features are hundreds of meters wide. Um, so the impacts can be pretty substantial. Uh, this is an example from uh, an area called Chenarak, not too far away from the village of Kitagaruit, a uh, really important cultural center for Inuvialuit. Uh, this is a picture of Max standing in that thaw slump. We had come here to look for a village site. Uh, so it was documented back in the 80s, a number of Igluyuit features. Uh, we wanted to come and take a look and see how things were doing. Uh, we couldn't find it. We actually thought maybe the dot's in the wrong place. We've come to the wrong spot. Let's get back in the chopper. But Max noticed some wood uh, down here, which looked like uprights. So these really kind of telltale pieces of the architecture and these are glary features. And sure enough, as we got down there into the muck and started poking around, uh, Max located a umiak cross strut. So this was actually part of a boat at one point in time, uh, which was likely integrated into the glary uh, architectural elements. Um, so really, I mean, a village with multiple Igluriwit features completely wiped out by the, the opening up of these permafrost uh, thaw slump features. Really, really major impacts in the area. This is an impact that I'm kind of starting to wrap my head around. Um, so tundra fires are having an influence. Uh, while the boreal zone has definitely seen the worst of the wildfire impacts, uh, tundra fires have also become more common in recent years. Uh, driven in part by more abundant lightning strikes, which result from increased storm activity. So you can imagine things are getting hotter, hotter for longer. Uh, we get these big convection cells, so big, big uh, thunderstorms can come up. And as a result, much more lightning strikes. Now, unlike in Inuit in central and eastern Inuit Nunangat, Inuvialuit and their ancestors made ample use of abundant driftwood that's present in the region. Uh, so in the east and center, we have a lot more kind of stone and bone architecture. So you can see here in this upper right image, uh, these are a pair of the Gloriwak, uh, younger than the ones that were McKinley Bay. They haven't quite collapsed to the extent that those ones had and gotten covered over by the sod, um, but they're still standing, uh, still clear wooden structures above the surface. Uh, further over, kind of underneath these three mosquitoes, um, and you can see further down here, um, there's actually a recently used Inuvialuit fish camp sitting right on the coastline, right near an ample supply of driftwood. Um, so I think you know, given this reliance on wood, uh, I think it's pretty easy to see how Inuvialuit cultural landscapes in particular are quite susceptible to more abundant tundra fires. So the last impact I'm gonna talk about uh, is related to sea level rise. Uh, so Canada has the greatest national shoreline in the world, over 200,000 kilometers of shoreline, uh, most of which is in Inuit Nunagat. Now you can see on this map uh, from Natural Resources Canada uh, showing the general uh, susceptibility of shorelines to sea level rise. Uh, the Inuvialuit settlement region is roughly in this area here. Uh, and you can see right here, huge area of high sensitivity shorelines. These are just shorelines that are going to be impacted more readily by sea level rise. Uh, there's a little bit over here, kind of in Northern Newfoundland, uh, quite a bit admittedly on the East Coast, but this, area is going to be heavily impacted by sea level rise. Now, part of the reason for that being, um, most of the Inuvial settlement region is actually sinking. Uh, so just to give a little bit of a background, uh, during the last ice age, there were literally kilometers thick ice sheets laying over most of what is now Canada. Uh, when those ice sheets retreated, or rather when those ice sheets were there, they caused the crust to deform. So they actually pushed the crust down into the mantle below, deforming the surface of the planet. Uh, when the ice retreated, all of that landscape started to pop back up. So what you see here with these green concentric lines are rates of uplift. So that's how fast that land is popping back up out of the mantle. And you can see here these kind of central areas are popping up at a rate of roughly 12 millimeters per year. So more than a centimeter of uplift every year. Now everything outside of this dotted line is actually sinking. And everything outside of the orange line is actually sinking at a rate of two millimeters or more. Uh, and you may think to yourself, two millimeters, I mean, 
whatever, who cares? It's two millimeters. Uh, but over time, that adds up. And this is really a compounding factor for the already alarming rates of sea level rise that are being projected by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, kind of an interesting implication here, um, sites in central and eastern Inuit Nunungat, by and large, uh, are rising up. So as you walk away from the waterline, you're actually walking backwards through time. Uh, the older sites are located further and further back from that waterline as a result of that uplift. Uh, such is not the case in the Inuit Outlet Settlement region. We actually don't have a lot of old sites. Many of them have already been impacted by coastal erosion or these subsiding land masses. So again, you can see here, uh, the New Gallet Settlement region outlined in white, uh, the vast majority of that region is in these areas where the land is subsiding. So really, really potentially huge impacts from sea level rise in the area. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like on the ground, uh, this is the community of tuk tuk uh, right in Kugmalet Bay, just south of the Beaufort Sea. Uh, this is the east channel of the Mackenzie River opening up here. And this is Tuck from the helicopter. Uh, really just a lovely community. I love visiting Tuk Tuk Tuk. Uh, it's really is in the ocean. Um, it's out there in the Beaufort Sea, very low lying, uh, very flat, um, very susceptible to sea level rise. So you can see Tuk 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 here. And this is at one meter of sea level rise, what will happen in Tuk Tuk Tuk. So one meter of sea level rise is kind of the more conservative, pardon me, is the best case kind of conservative estimate for where we're gonna see sea level rise take place by AD 2100. And these are projections again, made by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So best case scenario, if we get all of our carbon emissions under control, if we keep our temperature rises below 1.5 degrees, we're still looking at one meter of sea level rise by AD 2100. Now, in a worst case scenario, the IPCC is projecting roughly 2.6 meters of sea level rise. So this is if we just keep going gangbusters the way we are now, never mind the carbon, everything's fine. Um, you know, I've figured out roughly three meters of sea level rise if you factor in the rates of subsidence in the area. That's what's going to happen to Tuk Tuk Tuk. Um, and this is just sea level rise. This isn't a complex. Uh, so that you can see, you know, some pretty substantial impacts are in store for Tuk Tuk Tuk. Uh, that said, the community is already making mitigation plans. Um, they've applied to armor the shoreline, to put in different measures in order to prolong the amount of time that people can live in the community and allow people to have time to kind of pull back away from those eroding shorelines. Maybe pull the entire town site a little further inland, maintain access to that critical Beaufort Sea area, uh, but keep it so the waves aren't literally crashing on people's front doors. So I hope you can appreciate these impacts will be quite severe in some areas. Um, while I'm focusing here on Inuvialuit heritage, the implications for climate change are really wide ranging. Uh, town sites, personal homes, people's livelihoods and overall ways of life are really being impacted by these changes. Now, in 1982, uh, shortly after the Territorial, Territorial Museum was founded, the NWT archaeology program was established. Now, the very next year, the Mackenzie Delta Heritage Project was begun, and it was done to address the impacts that coastal erosion was already having on archaeological sites in the region. Uh, Dr. Charles Arnold, or Chuck Arnold, uh, senior archaeologist at the time and later director of the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, noted that the project was developed to address, and I quote, the need to provide opportunities for Northerners to become involved in the study and conservation of their archaeological heritage, unquote. So really, I mean, one of the most exciting aspects of being able to hold this new territorial climate change archaeologist position is being able to carry on the work that Dr. Arnold started roughly 40 years ago uh, to address the impacts of climate change on Inuvialuit ancestral sites by prioritizing Inuvialuit participation in that management process. Now, there's a number of acts and regulations that govern how archaeological materials are managed. Uh, which largely place the responsibility for their protection with the territorial government uh, or the federal government within the bounds of the national park lands. Uh, and hello to any Parks Canada staff who are watching today. Additionally, the 2030 NWT Climate Change Strategic Framework outlines the responsibilities of the territorial government in addressing the cumulative impacts of climate change, um, including impacts it's having on culture and heritage throughout the territory. However, it's also important to understand that these remains of the past are essential elements of Inuvialuit heritage and how these ancestral sites are treated really matters to Inuvialuit. 
Thus, in order to approach the management of the Nuvi Alawit ancestral sites in a way that's ethical and culturally appropriate, it's critical that Nuvi Alawit perspectives and cultural values be prioritized in the management process, a sentiment reflected in the rather eloquent quote you see here. Uh, furthermore, the Nuvi Alawit climate change adaptation strategy and the National Inuit Climate Change Strategy both provide guidance on the effective conduct of climate change planning within Inuit Nunangat and the essential role of Inuit in that process. Now, while I may be a little biased, uh, actually, I'm, I'm really biased about this, uh, I truly believe that maps can be powerful tools and efforts to mean meaningfully involve the public in the heritage management process. Uh, maps are incredibly potent for the way they can readily portray the landscape. Uh, distilling sometimes complex spatial data into a visual medium, uh, which is readily understandable to both specialists and non-experts alike, if you will. Uh, Community-based mapping initiatives, sometimes referred to as public participatory mapping methods, have certainly become more common in recent years, uh, though they actually have a fairly long history of use. Uh, one geographer in particular who applied his craft back in the 60s and 70s has strongly influenced my own cartographic approaches. So William Bunge, uh, also referred to as Wild Bill Bunge, uh, has made enormous contributions to the early development of community mapping methods. And his projects, including the Detroit Geographical Expedition in 1968, were truly groundbreaking for their time. So Bunge opted to apply his skills toward the investigation of inner city social justice issues by working with people from those communities to develop a series of what he termed Otnis maps. So these maps were meant to visually represent both the experiences and the aspirations of residents. So being able to display you know, both the way things are and the way things ought to be. These are really inspirational works and they centered the goals and values of the people who worked with him to create these maps. I strongly recommend anyone who has a passing interest in the topic of community mapping or kind of outsider academics who's blacklisted as a communist and ended up having to work in Canada, um, really go take a look into William Bunge's work, just fantastic stuff. So there's a few different ways that community mapping practices can be applied through climate change planning and archaeological site management efforts, uh, which I'm going to address over the next few slides. So first, I'm going to have a drink. Excuse me. First, they can provide an opportunity for people to see where climate change impacts are taking place, specifically in relation to the places they personally deem culturally significant. So they can portray existing spatial information in readily digestible formats for public review. Uh, the example here is from my PhD work, uh, which shows rates of shoreline change taking place near a series of Inuvialuit place names. Uh, these names were documented in the publication Nuna Alianaituk, Beautiful Land, a tremendous publication. I know I'm making a lot of pitches here, but strongly recommend anybody take a look at it if there's a passing name in top of them. It's a tremendous publication. Uh, on the back panel of the map are a series of details regarding those names, uh, as well as information about archaeological sites in the area and some general observations about the nature of coastal changes. Uh, so this kind of series of grid maps was ultimately developed in order to engage with community members around the types of impacts that are taking place. Now, community mapping projects not only portray existing information about the landscape, uh, they're also very effective at documenting public perspectives about those landscapes, ultimately resulting in a record of community desires, which can be applied toward the development of a management plan, which is rooted in the needs of the public. So in the next few slides, I'm going to provide a few examples of some of the mapping approaches that NWC Cultural Places program is planning, uh, which will allow us to establish what will hopefully become a regular series of community mapping projects, uh, which will stimulate discussions about how best to focus management efforts on protecting a new Vialuit ancestral sites. So given the pressing influence of coastal erosion on archaeological sites throughout the ISR, we've committed a fair bit of time to this topic. Uh, we currently rely on two different but complementary mapping approaches to assess coastal erosion impacts. So one of those methods involves creating these historical models of shoreline change uh, for a number of areas which we already know are of fairly high significance to Inuvialuit. Uh, working from archival air photos and more recent satellite imagery, we're able to trace out past shoreline positions using as Kelty said, GIS systems or geographic information system software, uh, which we can then use to calculate rates of change from. Uh, so here again, an example from my PhD work uh, using air photos from 1950, 1972 and 2004, I was able to trace out shorelines and then calculate rates of change in the vicinity over the span of those 54 years. 
and then took those methods and applied them to the entirety of the Kugmala Bay area, including a number of archaeological sites which haven't been assessed in person since the 1960s. Uh, so essentially giving us a bit of a window onto the area without having to set boots down. Now, the shoreline modeling approach provides a fairly good impression of how the landscape has changed in the recent past, but it, arrived, pardon me, but it relies on the presence of archival imagery, which isn't always available in areas of Inuit Unica. It also requires the purchase of air photos and satellite imagery, which can be tough on the budget, and it makes their application in broad regional scales a fairly pricey option. That said, staff in the NWT Cultural Places Program, myself included, continue to develop these kinds of historical shoreline models uh, for other Inuvialuit cultural sites beyond Kugmalit Bay, uh, using imagery which have been procured and processed by our colleagues at the NWT Center for Geomatics. So the other method of mapping out coastal erosion impacts that we're relying on uh, uses a recent and quite frankly, very exciting new product, uh, which was also developed by the NWT Center for Geomatics, namely the Landsat Long-Term Change Detection Project. So just a quick background, there's this particular group of satellites that are called the Landsat series, and they've been imaging the planet going back as far as 1985, uh, which has resulted in this tremendous archive of planetary images taken from space. On the downside, the resolution of the imagery means their relatively grainy view of the Earth is a result. Um, so you're not going to be able to necessarily find your house by looking at these images. However, the imagery covers the entire globe, and it's largely freely available. So by analyzing how each pixel in those satellite images, each individual pixel in 1985 to 2019 satellite imagery, uh, the NWT Center for Geomatics have been able to produce an image of the entire NWT which shows how the landscape has changed over time, again, between 1985 and 2019. Uh, these change values are then displayed as different colors, allowing people to more easily visualize on a reasonably coarse scale, the kinds of long-term changes taking place in the landscape. Now that said, these colors require a certain level of interpretation in order to understand what's happening on the ground. Uh, so we've actually taken it and compared it to the historical models of shoreline change and come up with some really good results. So you can see here, this is the long-term change detection uh, product. Here's a historical model of shoreline change. This is out at the area of Toker Point. It's about 25 kilometers north of tuk tuk uh, And here are just a couple of images showing what happened between 2013 and 2014 out at Toker Point. So roughly 8.5 meters of shoreline loss at this point. Uh, so this stake here was roughly 10 meters from the shoreline when we got there in 2013. 2014, it was less than two meters away. So huge levels of shoreline erosion which you can see pretty clearly here. So these dark blue areas here, 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 and here really correspond well with areas of heightened shoreline erosion shown in the historical model of shoreline change. Really good synergy there. Uh, additionally, areas of orange on this outer shoreline in the LTCD data uh, correspond perfectly well with areas that those beaches are actually forming, the sand spits and other ephemeral beach deposits. There's actually a number of non-erosion related changes we can see as well, uh, such as this orange fringe around these ponds, which are slowly desiccating, which is also a known climate change impact, the evaporation of tundra ponds. So I think it's worth pointing out at this point, these data are freely available to anyone with a computer. Uh, they've, been uh, they've been made available through an online story map interface, uh, which includes a user manual, background on how the project was developed, and a guide on how to interpret the different colors. Uh, so really, I mean, kudos to the NWT Center for Geomatics, not only for developing this incredible product, but for making it so readily available to the public. I think it's also important to highlight that while my own work is focused on coastal erosion, uh, these data are clearly capable of representing a range of landscape changes. Uh, so just to quickly go through here, because I think I'm getting close on time. Uh, my colleagues at the Cultural Places Program who focus more on southerly regions of the NWT are able to detect a, a melting alpine ice patches uh, where Dene ancestors would have hunted caribou in the summer. You can see pretty clearly they pop out as these green anomalies. Uh, we can even assess the impact of recent wildfires in archaeological sites, which show up as these kind of orangey blobs. Um, further still, we can look at thaw slumps. Uh, so here is an image from the helicopter of this particular thaw slump you can see on the left, uh, and boom. I mean, these incredibly bright yellow and orange anomalies in the LTCD data. Um, really, I mean, the potential applications are hugely broad. I love spending time with this LTCD product. Uh, so I really think it's going to be invaluable in the community mapping process, allowing community members to highlight areas of cultural significance which they consider at risk, uh, based on the presence of changes nearby, allowing us to work together to establish targets for more focused management efforts. 
Uh, so for example, because the LTCD data are relatively coarse grained, when a location is identified by community members as somewhere that would warrant further investigation, uh, we can meet those needs by purchasing more air photos and satellite imagery to develop historical models of shoreline change that allow us to monitor those locations on an annual basis, allowing us to return to communities on a regular basis to discuss new results from these annual imagery purchases, uh, which I think goes without saying is a heck of a lot cheaper than having to go out and get in a helicopter and go out on the land for a couple of weeks. That having been said, where there are major changes taking place or even minor changes in areas that are considered culturally significant, we can use these results to justify the expense involved in conducting site visits, uh, preferably with the very people who made those observations with us pouring over these maps. So here's an example from McKinley Bay, you know, really heavy shoreline erosions here. Uh, this is actually where that site, the set of three images is from of that house eroding. Uh, and here we have it over on the shoreline. We can even take that a step further and we can look at uh, maps of individual site features. And we can make additional maps, which allow us to begin establishing detailed site monitoring programs by working directly with community members to determine how long before more features are lost. So for me, I think part of the fun of looking over maps is the sense of discovery you get from pouring over the landscape with a bird's eye view, uh, peering down on familiar places and tracing out the features from above. I can almost guarantee you, if you put a map out on a table somewhere, within minutes, somebody's going to be standing beside you saying, hey, what are you looking at? Uh, it's a compulsion. I personally can't help myself. If I see a map, I'm going to go take a look. Uh, that said, as fun as maps can be, they can also become particularly powerful tools in the hands of the people who rely on the landscape for their livelihoods, for food, for raw materials, for the practice and intergenerational transmission of their respective cultures. Maps become a means of documenting and communicating truly expert perspectives on landscapes, as shared by the people who identify with and draw meaning from those landscapes. As a result, map-focused methods can be invaluable in establishing community-driven strategies for how best to respond to the influences of climate change. So I can say in all sincerity, I am thrilled to be here in Inuvik, finally here in Inuvik, uh, where I'll be able to continue working on maps, uh, talking to people while pouring over maps together, and discussing thoughts on what's at risk, what needs to be monitored or otherwise managed, and what needs to be allowed to disappear, which is also an important part of the management process. So in closing, I'd just like to reinforce that it's critical that archaeological site management efforts take place in accordance with the needs and heritage perspectives of the people who highly value those sites. And I hope I've managed to demonstrate today how maps can play an important role in making that happen. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mike. That was a really fantastic and fascinating talk um and yeah i love your emphasis on maps i am also biased <laughs> um so we had a couple questions come in um the first one is a question that i believe came in when you were sharing um some of the risks um that are posed to sites currently and the question was, how can we preserve these sensitive areas? Um, and I might broaden up the question a little bit because uh, I'm curious as well. So, oh, yeah, what's the process kind of once you identify the sites and if you identify any risks to the sites, what do you do from there? Right. So, I mean, ultimately, the goal is to get those directions from community members. Uh, so there's a range of different things that we can do. Um, I mean, we can let them go. Uh, that's actually a really important decision to be made. Uh, and it's important that the decision be made by community members to say, hey, you know what, this is the natural process. So be it. Um, another thing we can do is start monitoring. So like I said, we can decide, OK, this is an important area. We know there's some chain impacts taking place around it. Let's put that in our budget. Every year we have a rotating budget for these kinds of things. Let's make sure that we have satellite imagery every year for that particular site. And then we can develop, we can expand our erosion models. We can say, oh, wow, the 2021 summer season, that was terrible. We might need to do something more. Again, develop these maps, take them out to the community and say, what should we do? Should we let it go? Should we perhaps start writing grants to, in order to go out and start doing excavations? Uh, or maybe just go out and take, I mean, work with, we've got some really incredible drone experts with the NWT Center for Geomatics. Maybe bring them out. We can really document these things in high detail as they are without putting shovels in the ground. So there's a bunch of different stuff that we can do around monitoring and mitigating against the loss of these sites. Uh, or as I said, just letting them go.
Oh, I think you're muted, Kelty. I love muted. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I can appreciate knowing that, you know, sometimes we're not able to necessarily preserve the sites um, and protect them from the effects of climate change, but we can do our best. Um, right. My next question kind of, I think, leads into that or uh, comes from that a little bit. Um, so you had a number of pictures of various artifacts throughout your presentation. Um, where are the artifacts? Uh, have you collected them and are they on display anywhere? Right, so some of the artifacts uh, and materials that were collected through excavation, those objects go back to the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center. So that's the Territorial Museum and Archives in Yellowknife. Uh, that's a result of archeological legislation, which states that once objects have been pulled out of the ground, they're to be stored in perpetuity for the benefit of society at these repositories. Um, I know there's a number of projects in place right now. Uh, the Inuvial Living History Project in particular is looking at a lot of ways of digitizing these objects. Uh, so while they have to be stored in a museum for the time being, I mean, these replicas can be circulated. Um, but by and large, those objects, when they are collected, they end up in the museum. Sometimes some of the more delicate ones, um, you know, we actually get netting. Um, that comic in particular that was collected on Banks Island, that went to the Canadian Conservation Institute. So sometimes these objects will end up in the hands of really expert conservators who spend a great deal of time stabilizing them uh, because once they're pulled out of the ground even if it's you know potentially impacted by climate change pulling that out of that permafrost ultimately makes it rot i mean that, that begins that rotting process so they have to be cared for very carefully by conservators uh, so some of them end up going to ottawa sometimes for several years they'll be soaking in various chemical concoctions to make sure that they don't begin to rot just for the sake of being out in the air 2500 years after they were made um, so yeah there's a couple different ways that those objects can be dealt with some of the stuff that large pile of materials that we found during our tea breaks for instance we didn't gather that um, those objects were collected from the water just to get an idea of the volumes and the kinds of materials that were washing out of the site um, but we don't know where they came from. We don't know what feature they were from. We can't get any radiocarbon dates on them. There's not a lot that we can say about them. Uh, so that kind of informational value is lost. So we have no, we, I mean, we're not collectors. The archeological discipline kind of arose out of antiquarianism and these collecting traditions. Um, that's really not the case anymore. We're not here to get stuff out of the ground. Uh, we really wanna answer questions and we want to engage public notions of heritage through these kinds of projects. Okay, thank you. And if you look in the chat, um, we have posted the link to the speaker series where they're hosted on the Aurora College website. So you can check that out. This uh, particular webinar will be uploaded shortly. Um, so you can view it again there. Um, and then we don't have a question, but we just have a, a great presentation and thank you. So mm. just wanted to pass that along. Thanks. Um, oh, and we just had another question come in. Um, how do you <laughs> think a climate change archaeology approach can have impact or inform heritage management in other NWT regions? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, as much as the this climate change archaeologist position is situated in Inuvik, and it really is focused on the Inuvial settlement region, um, the methods that we're developing are absolutely being applied throughout the NWT. Uh, so my colleagues at the museum, uh, Naomi, Julie, Sarah, and Glenn, uh, they all work in various regions kind of further south in the NWT. And all of these approaches are being deployed in very similar ways throughout those areas as well. So I think they're highly applicable to other areas within the NWT and beyond. I mean, again, I, I, I know I'm making a lot of pitches through this talk, but this long-term change detection product is really incredible. Uh, the Center for Geomatics, the methods that they've used to put this together, um, they can ultimately be deployed in other areas. Uh, Steve Schwartz might rein me in on this, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think a lot of the scripts that he used in order to develop this process are effectively open source. So, I mean, whether you're in Alaska, you're in the Yukon, you're in Nunavut, uh, you're in Nunatsiavut, those are the kinds of methods that can be deployed. And again, it's Landsat data, so anybody has access to it. And if it's open source code and it's free data, 
anybody can create these things. Actually, I saw not too long ago, the Russians are using very similar methods to look for these, they call them hell holes, uh, these giant methane explosions that happen out in the middle of the tundra. Uh, they're looking for where these are happening. Instead of flying over the area, they just look for giant orange dots in the long-term change detection data to say, okay, we've got some more erupting over here. So these types of methods, I think, can be deployed really anywhere. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think I'll just give another minute um, for any last minute questions to come in. But for now, I think that um, is everything so far. So uh, thank you, Mike. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your questions and your engagement in this really fascinating topic, I think. Um, again, that webinar will be posted um, online shortly. I will post that link again in the chat for everyone to see. And with that, I'll say uh, happy or mappy GIS day, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll uh, see you all at the next speaker series, hopefully. Thanks a lot, Kalti. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.